Thank you again for the uh, for the invitation. I'm very happy to um, uh, interact with the group here, and thank you for the kind introduction. So, I actually wanted to just mention uh, uh, hello from Kyrgyzstan. So I'm actually in the Kyrgyz Republic right now. It's nighttime, so I couldn't show you a live uh, view into our beautiful setting here. So I put on uh, just a picture of what's behind the campus um, here in Noreen, Kyrgyzstan. So in one of the kind of poorest parts of the country, uh, but not poor in terms of the beauty. You can see different mountain ranges, the Naran River here. And this was just taken a few weeks ago by me and it's already warmed up quite a bit, even though it's just the end of February. Um, but you can see that the winter is, is nice and strong here and gives us a beautiful environment to be in. So uh, this is a, a presentation that contains a lot of um, ongoing work and it's really um, been inspired by um, some of my experiences in the last year. So I'm on my sabbatical. That's why I can take the time to be here in the Kyrgyz Republic. And in the fall, I was spending time in Karachi, Pakistan. And so you'll see that in a couple of the projects that I'll speak about today, as well as some other work and how it all ties into uh, ongoing uh, efforts at NYU as well. I thought I would just back, uh, back up to the top and start out with, um, as we're all familiar with, the, um, the broad strokes definition of health equity. This is from the World Health Organization. So you all can read this um, in terms of talking about uh, what health equity is, um, and how we define it as uh, unfair or and avoidable and remediable differences in health amongst population groups that are defined across multiple axes. And so health disparities, like in the, my title, are actually the metrics. So uh, if you're quantitatively oriented and thinking like me, those are one way we can actually use to measure progress towards achieving health equity. So why is this important? The next few slides are gonna give a little bit of motivation for that. And uh, of course, speaking to this crowd, everyone is, is fully aware, but let's look at some of the data. So we see a lot of disparities um, at multiple spatial scales. So starting at a global level and looking at uh, expected lifespan um, by country. So some of the countries with the highest expected lifespan are Hong, right now are Hong Kong, Japan, Switzerland, all around a mean of 85 years. Whereas um, on the lower end, we have Central African Republic, Chad, Lesotho, all around um, uh, 53, 54 years. So that's actually a massive 30 year difference. In fact, in some places we could say people have basically two lives for every one that people have in other places. Now, as I mentioned, this these disparities show up at different spatial scales as well. So let's zoom into the United States. And we see some disparities here that rival the differences we saw, we saw at the national scale. And so the difference in life expectancy between the most healthy and least healthy counties on this map is actually greater than the difference between, uh, for example, the United States and Mali on the previous map. And so depending on where you live in the United States, life expectancy can vary uh, by more than 20 years. Going even further now, let's look at New York City, uh, where I'm typically based. And we see at this level, we also see dramatic differences um, for different parts of the city. And actually that can vary going from very, um, some of the highest places to lowest and then back to high, just across um, a few different uh, census tracts. Now the most, um, not only is this very unacceptable, but it's also very, um, uh, uh, not great that these inequalities are actually widening in recent years as well. So this is data from the National Academies of Science looking at life expectancy for just women now. And within the group of women, we see that while life expectancy over about 30 year period from 1980 to 2010 increased for the poorest group of women, this actually decreased. And so we can see that not only do we have these spark um, disparities, but they're actually widening. Now, why is this the case? And so here's where we can start to delve into the health disparities literature, where all of these um, uh, uh, effects are well studied. And we know that they're directly related to historical and current unequal distribution of social, political, economic, and environmental resources. And 
these, um, one can call, bracket those as social determinants, um, influence health in terms of resulting in disparities all the way from, first of all, the risk of illness, so development of illness, ability to utilize health care to actually um, uh, work through those illnesses, illnesses, and finally, in terms of act the actual health and health care outcomes, right? So we see disparities all across the board there. Now, the, uh, one thing that should be of notice, um, so for someone like me, a researcher, when we think about any kind of intervention, science-generated um, interventions, we should also be careful because what is also well studied in the health, um, health and other disparities literature is how certain interventions actually may enhance inequality, okay? So one example of this would be um, uh, smoking. So for, for example, from the 1950s until today, tobacco smoking rates in the United States um, dramatically declined, right? So that's, um, that's undoubtedly positive that adult smoking rate dropped from about 47% in 1953 to 15% today. But in 1953, smoking rates were actually similar at all education levels. However, today, uh, for graduate degree holders, fewer than 4% of them smoke compared to uh, high school education, uh, folks with who got a high school level of education, about 34% of them smoke. And so even though overall smoking rates have dropped, these inequalities in smoking have actually, rates have actually sharply increased. Now, among uh, the reasons for this is that typically a lot of um, uh, smoking interventions, um, one can understand them to, uh, to work with an income effect. Basically, folks who are already um, better well off um, socioeconomically, have access to better education, are able to invest more effort and time into things like um, uh, programs which might require you to take it upon yourself to quit smoking, right? So you can imagine that that's probably the most straightforward way um, that one can think about um, smoking cessation programs and they would require um, a lot of uh, effort and time by the individual. However, we might instead, on the other hand, in order to maybe achieve smoking cessation, but also not advance inequalities, we might seek policies that provide the biggest benefits, first of all, to those, for example, with the least education, okay? Or policies or think about interventions that would benefit those groups more. And this is important because low socioeconomic groups typically carry the highest burden of disease as well. And so to be clear, medical advances are important, new intervention types are important, but we also need to pay attention to equity as we proceed along any of these um, uh, interventions. Okay. Um, so right, so uh, as this, just to summarize in this slide, some types of interventions might widen inequalities, typically those that require the individual to uh, leverage maybe resources they already have, time, money, effort, etc. cetera. Okay. And in general, inequality as a society, at a societal level is itself harmful across the population as a whole. And I'll talk about that more in a few slides. Um, but it's just more motivation for us to, as we think about interventions or any kind of scientific inquiries, to always keep in mind that we have the possibility to actually augment inequalities. A nice way that um, we can, one framework we can use to think about both the development of health disparities and their, um, their causes, as well as where we can intervene is the socio-ecological framework. So this is back from 1977. Uh, I put the orig uh, original paper uh, citation here. And the framework basically shows um, the multi-level factors that uh, contribute to our health in terms of the whole spectrum, maybe development of illness, access to healthcare, and also health outcomes. So of course we have the individual, our characteristics, maybe our biomedical measures in the center. And we know that our health is also influenced by, for example, the social networks we're set in, families and friends, uh, organizations, the types of communities that we um, spend time in, as well as of course the policies that we live in. Okay, so I didn't know the right way to do this, but I wanted to, you know, such a significant um, uh, thing happened this week where um, 
Paul, Dr. Paul Farmer passed away and he was such an influence in the whole world of global health, health equity. And so I just wanted to uh, pay a small tribute to him. And it's really relevant in terms of um, when we talk about these determinants of health. And of course, um, Dr. Farmer used the term uh, structural violence that he developed um, this term to explain these differences uh, that people live in simultaneously. So while we might have um, certain advances, accumulations of wealth and resource on the one hand, we have just um, unacceptable um, uh, outcomes and contexts on at the same time and the other. And so again, this causes us to think about how when we um, think about interventions or any kind of scientific inquiry, we really have the possibility to affect both of those simultaneously as well. And so, um, uh, yeah. And as I earlier alluded to, health disparities are relevant for all of us. Okay, so this happens on multiple scales as well. I'll just, I just put a, uh, one uh, quick uh, citation here from a study looking at um, deaths averted due to medical advances over a specific time frame, 1991 to 2000 in the United States. And they um, estimated the number of deaths averted due to those advances. But at the same time, they also looked at what would happen if we spent um, during that same time equalizing mortality amongst different groups. And you can see how there's actually different avenues we can pursue um, as we uh, continue our scientific inquiries. And uh, second of all, a little bit of background from, this is actually from the city of Buffalo. They had a nice um, uh, summary of this on their website, talking about uh, motivation for health equity and how improving the health of individuals um, that are in the most disadvantaged groups actually improves overall not health, but we can also extend that to other factors in the city. One can imagine through um, economic productivity, for social factors, innovation, knowledge generation, Really, when we think about um, lifting up everybody that magnifies as we extend to the entire population. Okay, so set up a lot of background about health equity, the importance of it. And also when we start thinking about um, intervention, scientific inquiry, why this is of extreme importance. And so now I'm gonna bring this to a few different avenues of our work in data, data science, and how we're thinking about using that um, in this context. So I'll have three examples today. Uh, one of them will be talking about using data to illuminate the social influence of, um, on genetic diseases. Uh, so you'll learn more about that. Uh, second of all, addressing epidemiology gaps and advocacy with data science. And finally, the third question we'll pose is about who is leveraging data, data science and why that's important as well. So as we saw from the socio-ecological framework, uh, uh, there's a lot of knowledge base around social determination of diseases, cross infectious diseases, non-communicable diseases. Uh, one straightforward example is obesity, especially childhood obesity. And there's a lot of epi good epidemiological work showing how the influence of the spaces we live in, the physical, re the physical activity, um, availability, food resources can, uh, can shape what kinds of behaviors we can engage in, and of course, what kinds of outcomes we see in terms of, in this case, obesity. Uh, social determinants of infectious diseases have also been studied at length um, for different, um, from you know, malaria to dengue to other, uh, to cholera. And of course, most recently we have the COVID-19 pandemic and it was, it's become uh, very clear um, how um, social determinants really uh, affect um, who's at risk for COVID, who can mitigate risk for COVID based on their activities, um, who can access good care for COVID, et, et cetera, et cetera. And so the social factors around different types of diseases are very vivid. And so they, this brings me to the next point about who is really leveraging data science. And uh, this is actually a paper we wrote uh, about two years ago now. Um, actually, um, we aimed it at a computer science audience because a lot of my work is actually in the computational world where we have um, uh, an, a need for better representation. Uh, but the real motivating part here, and I put all the citations that we took this work from at the bottom just to show you the wealth of study that has actually been done to show that 
lack of diversity is known to actually lead to poor outcomes. And you might wonder, well, what kind of outcomes? And it's across so many different fields um, in terms of hospital, healthcare, quality outcomes, management and firms, scientific discoveries, economic profit, machine learning. And so really having a diverse group is really important to achieve our goals across many different fields. If we're looking specifically at data science, um, we have this uh, map here showing the number of data science professionals per job on LinkedIn by country. So this kind of this gives us two things to look at. One, of course, the number of data science professionals um, we can see per job, but even it gives us a sense about where there might be jobs available on LinkedIn. Granted, this is one website that probably maybe the website's not that well used in different countries, but it also gives us a sense of what kind of um, countries might have those jobs listed um, on this fairly large website, right? So this shows us a couple of things. So this is kind of some of these two, all of these um, factors in, uh, that I've led up to have led to their, um, uh, the development of a new training program. And this is part of uh, a larger in initiative by the NIH um, Office of the Director, Data Science uh, Africa. They have set up a few research hubs, as well as multiple training programs, ours included, um, and other coordinating um, centers in order to advance efforts in biomedical and health data science um, in, in the continent. And so our program, I wanted to highlight, really leverages a lot of ongoing work. It doesn't stand on its own. There's been so much um, collaboration and good work developing um, training at uh, Moy University, that's in uh, Western Kenya, um, by Dr. Ann Wangi, who's an associate professor there, and um, as well as uh, uh, Brown University, Dr. Hogan, and as well as the NYU Langone, Dr. Vinandan. So we had a lot of good collaborations. Um, folks might have heard of the Empath Network um, that have been advancing training at Moy. And so we decided to take, given this opportunity, take it the next step and think about how can we advance that to data science. So uh, I mentioned earlier that a lot of that training had been in biostatistics, which is very imperative um, for this area. So we decided to focus the um, training program, interestingly, on social determinants. Now, you might have um, realized why that might be the case from some of the earlier uh, work I cited, thinking about, well, what do we consider at data, about data? Do we, um, uh, do we account for those upstream determinants well in when we think about data analyses? And that's kind of the impetus for our focus on social determinants. This also allows us to be cross-cutting across disease areas, so we can actually have, as we anticipate, um, a variety of folks from Moy in different areas of medicine, nursing, other allied health areas who can also benefit from um, such uh, training. And so the idea is that um, we'll have, of course, we have some um, faculty members already, PhDs from um, Moy University who have very good biostatistics training from the ongoing work that's been going on to add on to some of the modern analytic methods um, by taking courses that are available, for example, at NYU, which has um, a program. The idea for that, for them to then help um, develop that their own uh, data science curriculum at Moy. And of course, we'll have ongoing um, workshops extending outside of Moy through a network, um, mostly in Kenya, um, to focus on uh, uh, in, you know, basically building capacity and allowing folks to get equipped to then have their own, um, to leverage data science in, in their own way. So this little, this graph here just shows the need for, again, for data science um, for social determinants, both to capture all those um, upstream factors. Um, a lot of those tend to be more unstructured. We don't have data that might tell us about the discrimination faced by everybody on a daily basis or what the environment is like. So we kind of need to use advanced data science methods to create those features. And then of course, we have a lot of complex interactions between all of these factors now, once we start thinking in those multiple levels. And so we can also leverage um, data science machine learning methods to capture those complex uh, uh, interactions. Yeah, I'll just wanted to um, end off and by showing a little bit more of the research going on or on my group um, related to these topics. So I thought that would be of interest. One is looking at uh, integrating social determinants in machine learning clinical risk prediction models. Risk prediction for different clinical outcomes is, of course, um, very uh, important for disease prevention. Uh, and because we're seeing a lot of, especially non-communicable disease 
um, burden growing around the world. And given that's happening in such a short time period, we know it's a lot of the environmental changes that are driving it. We think it's imperative to assess how we can integrate those factors into, into our risk predictions. Um, and some other interesting work going on is we uh, have used satellite imagery, for example, to get better understanding of the environments, again, those upstream factors, but also how do we do that if we have um, data maybe from one place, can we transfer that kind of model to another place? Um, and we see that often in terms of like uh, machine learning models, trying to use them on different populations. And so we're thinking about what are the um, invariant and variant factors we can do to, to achieve that. So I wanted to give a big acknowledgement to all of my wonderful students who do such uh, great work. Uh, this is such a nice time we had. This was uh, several years ago now before the pandemic. Uh, I mentioned my dear collaborator, Dr. Zainab, at uh, Dr. Zainab Samad at AKU and her new uh, Citric Health Data Science Center, which is doing phenomenal work. And I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs>